I played Rook E5. Kapow! I'm not even taking anything and offering up a Rook for it seems like nothing but a diagonal. A diagonal, folks. And now yeah. this. <laughs> if my king move out of the way to attack! Okay, I make a move. Sacrificing pieces left and right. It's about speed, it's about action, it's about adrenaline. Game on. So, I'm 26 years old, and it may be a little bit strange to say this, but last week I think I played the most beautiful game I may ever play. And I really want to set that scene for y'all. So, I'm playing the ExtraCon Open. Um, it's a really strong international chess tournament in Denmark. Um, there are players from all around the world playing, almost like a UN of talent going on. Just super excited to play in an event like this. And there are a lot of strong grandmasters. Now, for those of you that don't know, a grandmaster is the highest title you can achieve in chess. And it's actually uh, a personal goal of mine. Um, I've been striving for that since I was young. And um, I mean, it would just mean the world to me to get there. Um, but you know, almost like the saying goes, to be the man, you gotta beat the man. And uh, it's the same as the case, is the same is true with being a Kren master. This is a huge opportunity for me to show my stuff against people that are, you know, on paper better than me. After three rounds, I actually won all my games. Uh, the fourth round, I was paired up against, you know, a Moby Dick type player. Um, this guy named Alexander Moisenko, a 2,600 plus player, even 2,700 at one point. And this is like, you know, this is like really strong stuff. So um, I was excited. Like, I honestly, like, I get up for these opportunities. I think I relish in being the underdog, and it's an opportunity to show, you know, what I've, what I'm made of, what I think I'm made of. And during the game, I realized I could do something special, and it was just about executing and sort of living in that moment, and relishing the opportunity. And uh, I'm hoping I can share some of those moments with you during uh, this thing. Alexander Moisenko played d4. I played d5, c4, e6, knight c3, knight f6 c takes d5 e takes d5 and this is actually the queen's gambit exchange variation it's a very positional line kind of the idea in many respects is to kind of uh put black under some pressure in the center by eventually playing for this e4 pawn break um, and just kind of run you over and i kind of knew about this plan and had some ideas of my own so after bishop g5 i went c6 and then e3 was played and i went bishop d6 very unusual move. Normally in these structures, the bishop goes to e7 to neutralize the pin on the D h4, d8 diagonal. Um, but in this game, I had some ideas and you'll see them. So after bishop d6, uh, white played... Ooh, what did white play? So white played bishop d3. Um, I castled. Castling isn't typically good in chess. You want to Tick, tuck your king over to the side before you get in with the action in the middle. So after castling, uh, white played queen c2. And this is another veiled threat, kind of lining up the bishop and queen and this battery against my pawn on h7. Note that I can't recapture with my knight on f6 because of this pin. Uh, so I have to play h6 to kick the bishop off that line and to protect the pawn. So after h6, bishop h4 is played. And then I went rook e8 and white played knight g e2. Knight g e2 is kind of consistent with this Botvinnik type of plan for with playing for e4, so you want to go f3 and e4, and so that's kind of consistent uh, with that plan. And now I go for a very unusual maneuver. First I start with a5, taking space on the queen side, and kind of discouraging white from castling queen side. White has that option right now, um, so I kind of want to play a5 to discourage that. And then after h3, I played knight a6. Knight a6 is a very, very unusual move, but you're going to see this knight takes a little bit of a journey. And uh, I don't know, maybe we call it the Tour de France uh, Knights Edition. Well, I don't know. We'll see if that sticks. So anyway, so knight a6 was played, threatening a3, and uh, threatening knight b4, so a3 was played uh, to defend that. Again, the bishop is usually better than the knight, even though they teach you when you're a beginner that they're both worth three points. You kind of learn that the bishops are menaces to society and you want to keep those. So a3 stops that. Um, then I win knight c7. Uh, again, rerouting this knight towards the middle. Um, now white castled. And then I went knight e6. And then black played, oh, then white played f3 going for this typical e4 thrust. And then, and then, 
I went knight g5. And now think about this trip of this knight. It's gone a6, c7, e6, g5. That's like four knight moves in a row. That's kind of crazy. And now it looks like white can just play e4 and take over the center like we talked about. And after e4, it actually turns out that's a losing mistake. And I'd actually worked this out at home six months ago. Um, uh, and I kind of was like, wow, he's going right into the thing that I looked at six months ago. How is this even real? And I thought for a moment and I knew exactly what to do. I went knight f takes e4. That's like kapow. That's like kablooey. Bam. That's like, that's a big move. That's a big time move. Um, the point being that after f takes e4, which was played, um, then I played knight takes h3 check. So it's like a, a knight sacrifice to rip open white's kingside. Um, and now my queen on d8 is uncovered and I can capture the bishop on h4. So after g takes h3, I went queen takes h4. And all of a sudden, white's king is like an emperor with no clothes. And I have these bishops like lasers lined up against the king, a queen on h4, you know, already have two pawns for the piece and like it's about to be gangbusters. So he thought for like, this guy thought for me like 20, 30 minutes, realized that like this is not a good situation. He wanted to still buckle down and try to hold on. But actually, believe it or not, at this moment, like 15, 16 moves in, it was already clear to me that I was going to win this game because you don't get opportunities like this and I was not going to let this one go. So anyways, after uh, queen takes h4, white played rook f2 trying to fortify the king side, trying to give the, that king some clothes. And I took a third pawn with bishop takes h3. Uh, my opponent played rook d1, trying to bring another piece over to the king side, fortify, uh, fortify that king side. And I played, this was already a kind of a, a brilliant game, if I may say so myself. You don't get to you know, move your knight around like this every day. You don't get to sack pieces every day, particularly against this level of opposition. But um, this move, I think I'll remember this one for a long time. I played rook e5, rook e5. I'm not even taking anything and offering up a rook for it seems like nothing, but a diagonal, a diagonal, folks. And I was just giddy during the game. I made that move. I got up from the board. You're allowed to get up from the board when you're playing. You can walk around. You know, it's, it's kind of hard sitting at the board for five, six hours, especially if you can't, if you have a lot of built up tension, it might be nice not to sit still. So I got walked around and I was like, I got this. We we grooving now. We doing we're doing we, I got this. So the point being was that rook e5 kind of needs to be taken that rook because it's swing over to g5 with check with decisive effect. And after d takes e5, I play this move bishop c5 and now this bishop has a new diagonal to work with screaming along that diagonal. And it's just like it's like murder's row over here like just the bishops are just you know, they're clocking in overtime. I mean, that's what they're doing. They're like, they're not working nine to five. They're like working like, it's like a 24 hour shift. So those bishops were doing work. The queen is coming in like, and there's really now immense pressure on that rook on F2, which is pinned. So white decided to jettison a piece because already white has a rook and a knight up, but there's just nothing to be done. So he decided to give that one of the knights back with knight d4. I took it, bishop takes d4, and I still have the same threats I had in the last move, which is playing queen g3 check, and bishop takes, H2, bishop takes f2. So after, knight takes d, uh, after bishop takes d4, um, then white played rook d, d2, um, defending uh, the rook uh, horizontally along the second rank um, with the queen. But it turns out that all of white's pieces are kind of stumbling over each other. They're, they're, you know, what we like to call superfluous. They're not, they're, not, they're not doing different jobs. They're doing kind of the same job, which makes them useless. And my bishops are all doing different jobs. My queen is doing a different job. So now it's time to put the nail in the coffin. And I was looking, I was like, do I need this other rook on a8? Do I need to, you know, shuffle that into the attack? It turned out I didn't even need the rook. And I was like, oh my gosh, can I just finish this without the rook? Wow. Let's go for it. So I went queen g3 check, forcing the king over to the corner on h1, only move. And then this really neat retreating move, bishop g4. And the beautiful thing about it is that the rook on f2 is no longer pinned. Uh, it's free to move. 
But the problem is if it moves anywhere uh, that isn't uh, on the back rank, I actually have queen g1 checkmate all the time, which is just out of this world. So to deal with that, uh, that this, uh, this threat, white actually decided to try and play bishop f1 and not move the rook at all to anticipate my bishop f3 check move. Uh, but after bishop f1, I went bishop f3 check anyway. And again, rook takes f3 is not possible because queen g1 mate. And after bishop g2, now I have queen h3 check. And now there's just pins and, you know, pins and discoveries everywhere. Essentially, the bishop on g2 can't take the queen h3 because that bishop is pinned. And uh, unfortunately, my opponent resigned here. I say unfortunately because it was actually made in one. If white's king just nudged over to king g1, I have queen takes g2 checkmate. And that's, you know, you never get checkmate on the board at this level. It's like a, a courtesy if they give you checkmate. Normally, opponents just resign well before the inevitable. It's kind of, it's almost like this weird chess etiquette that people abide by, um, which is fair. It's, it's, a, it's the right thing to do. But I thought I might get a chance at this, you know, aesthetic moment. In any case, the position after queen h3 check, where I resigned, and that's my Mona Lisa. I just realized I'd done something special and that the tournament potentially was going to be something special. Um, and it actually turned out to be uh, my second Grandmaster Norm. I earned my second Grandmaster Norm. You need three to become a Grandmaster in addition to a certain rating. And, um, and winning that game um, really set me on my way and uh, gave me confidence and energy and just an exuberance you don't always get from the game. Um, I'll tell you this much. I mean, you don't make money in chess, really, but, um, you know, sometimes the game gives you this unbridled joy, and that's why I play the game, because it's just, you know, there are moments like that where it's like, you know, you just remember, like, that's why I'm doing this. So, yeah, that, that's what that's the where, where the magic happens, you know? So, um, yeah, it was a real treat, and uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Thanks for watching. Um, if you like what you saw here, uh, definitely be sure to subscribe to Outright Chess Channel. They're going to have a lot of uh, awesome content for you here, so definitely check that out. And if you want to, you know, learn more about uh, my Grandmaster journey, be sure to uh, check out some of the links in the bio. Peace.